Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels and the glory of his Father. And then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Roman Empire this, Roman Empire that. My goodness gracious, I imagine Jesus must have gotten sick and tired of everybody complimenting the Roman Empire and talking about how cool everything was. Jesus' world was dominated by the Roman Empire. And you might imagine, I mean, like, let's just create a parallel. Let's say, like, some <coughs> aliens land their, their UFOs on Earth and they have cars that fly and they can cure cancer and they can snap their fingers and build buildings in a flash. That kind of technological leap from where we are now is similar to the kind of technological leap that the Roman Empire was bringing everywhere that it went. It brings to mind that, um, what is it, the, um, that movie, uh, Life of Brian, of, um, what am I trying to say, the um, Monty Python. You've heard the line, was it? What has the Roman Empire ever given us? Well, they did give us roads. Okay, but besides roads, what did the Roman Empire... Well, they did bring uh, clean water and, um, and safety to the streets. Okay, but besides roads, clean water, and safety to the streets, what did the Roman Empire ever bring to us? Well, they, um, you know, they brought us trade. They brought, and it sort of, it goes on and on and on until finally they're like, okay, but besides this, 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 what has the Roman Empire ever given us? And they all say, nothing. <laughs> and they all decide to go and attack them. This was the kind of idea and mindset that so many people must have had in Jesus' time about the Roman Empire. Roman Empire this, Roman Empire that. Aren't, isn't it glorious? Isn't it wealthy? Isn't it powerful? Isn't it huge? Isn't Caesar incredible? Look at the glory of the centurions. Look at the power of their armies. Everybody's so impressed. And now imagine what Jesus' heart must have thought, listening to all these things. Jesus is thinking, if you think Caesar's great, you should see my dad. He's, Jesus is thinking, if you think this is glory, you should see the glory of the heavenly kingdom. Over and over again, every time somebody wanted to point to something and, you know, isn't it wonderful they brought safety to the streets? You should see safety in the streets in the kingdom of God. Jesus must have gotten sick and tired of everybody being so wrapped up with the kingdoms of this world, the empire of this world, that he finally made it a centerpiece of all of his sermons to say, you think this empire is great? You should see the empire of heaven. You've heard it as kingdom of heaven, right? Um, but the word Basileia is actually the same word for empire. I'm not sure why we never translated it to empire of heaven. I think empire sounds too imperial. It sounds too Star Wars. It sounds too Darth Vader. We're supposed to resist the empire. So we don't want empire of heaven. But that's literally the word Jesus is saying. 
Every time Jesus says the, the kingdom of heaven has come near, he's saying the Roman Empire might be here, but God's empire is right on the horizon. God's empire is dawning, and it is as different from the Roman Empire as you could possibly imagine. Jesus always sort of had this dual level mindset, and it's something I think he, he's trying to impress on his followers. That's why I'm spending a minute on it now, because we have to train ourselves to think this way. There's treasures on earth. Wouldn't it be nice to have a big bank account? Yes, it would. But there's also treasures in heaven. There's these parallel kingdoms. And Jesus says, don't work for treasure in heaven, on earth where moth and rust can consume and people break in and steal. Work for treasures in heaven. Jesus was always seeing on the higher level, isn't the empire of Rome great? Yes, but think about what is the empire of heaven? Live for the empire of heaven. Let your mind be set on the kingdom, empire of heaven. Don't worry about being a citizen of the, of, of the Roman empire. What would it be like if you saw yourself as a citizen now of the empire of heaven? What are the values of that empire? What is the life in that empire? What is the, the way that people interact with each other? How do they love each other? What do families look like in that empire? Let's already begin to live there. And in a sense, Jesus, as he went everywhere he went, he saw himself as expanding that empire. Jesus was like, um, you know, at, at Rome under Julius Caesar, first creating the empire. Jesus is creating a new one. Everywhere he goes, the empire has stretched. Everywhere he goes, the empire has grown. Jesus says, the kingdom of empire, the empire of God has now come to you. It's now here in this church. The borders have now stretched to this back wall, and you can all become a part of it. How would you like to join? The problem with the Roman Empire that Jesus has in mind today particularly is that earthly empires, apart from whatever seemingly glory they might have, oftentimes are very worried about their own destruction. And this is not only sort of, you know, the Roman Empire, but everybody, I mean, every nation has laws against treason, right? It's like, well, you, there is, we have a right to free speech, but you cannot subvert your government. That's a law, that's a rule, right? Every system, I mean, I'm talking book groups, have like implicit rules in place where you know if, if you break this line or you, you cross this, this, this border or you say that thing or you act in that way, you're going to be out. Organizations in the world have systems built in to protect them. And for the Roman Empire, the number one was, well, it started with a C. It rhymes with dross. <laughs> Jesus looked out at the Roman Empire, which used the cross to enforce fear in the people so they would do nothing that would resist Rome. You could be crucified for doing all sorts of really kind of basic, simple things if the state interpreted it as you crossing the line and threatening their kingdom. If you advocated for peace, you could be crucified. You could be crucified if it was interpreted that you saying peace was an assault on the empire or trying to subvert their power of, of war or their military power to maintain empire. You could be crucified for talking about peace. You could be crucified if you didn't pay your taxes because it could be seen as subverting the empire. You could be crucified if you pushed monotheism too hard because it was seen as a threat to the, to the diversity of the empire where everybody could have whatever gods they wanted, but you're saying there's only one God. If you go too far, we're going to put you on the cross. <coughs> this was the system, this whole point of the cross. You know, they didn't like crucify people in back rooms in the dark in the, at midnight, right? They crucified people at noon on the main road where everybody could see. And they put signs above their head that basically said, this could be you, watch out. Stay on the straight and narrow, don't mess with Rome, or this could be you. And then if you wanted to go, go to Kroger, you had to pass the crosses. If you wanted to, like, to, to, to go off island, you'd have to pass the crosses. If you wanted to come in and out of the city, you'd have to pass the crosses. And there they were, threatening you. Stay in line, keep quiet, march like a soldier. Peter is impressed by all of this. 
And by that, I don't necessarily mean he thinks it's amazing. I mean that he has been affected by it, right? Peter sees the crosses. He's in, internalized the idea that you can't do anything that's going to threaten the empire um, or else you're going to die. And when Jesus starts to say, what I'm going to do is going to lead to death, Peter can't handle it. Peter resists Jesus. He pushes back against him. He says, absolutely not. You can't do those things. We can't lose you. If they say that's the rule, you can't break the rule, Jesus, because you can't die. Which is why suddenly he realizes he's got to give everybody a, a, a clarify a teaching, which is that dying is not the worst thing. Because if you live in fear, you're dying already. If, if, if you're if you're modulate, if you, if you feel called to acts that are righteous and true, but you don't do them because you're afraid, you're dying already. If you keep quiet because you're afraid of what people are going to say, then you're dying already, and you're dying on a, on, in spirit. You're dying uh, uh, in, in, in soul. You're, you're dying a kingdom of, of God death. You're living in the kingdom of this world, but you're closing yourself off all of those things. Jesus knew that that matters more than every, anything. You have to live for that. You've got to be there. You have to, you have to be strong there and let that be the, the place where you, your heart is lodged and where your directions, from which your directions come. So he gathers everybody together and he says, look, I need you to be willing to take up your cross. I need you to be willing to accept the consequences. Now, I want you to hear that, that when Jesus is saying this, it is primarily political. When people say, like, the gospel is not political, that the cross was a Roman Empire instrument of torture, Jesus is saying you have to be willing to accept the Roman Empire's worst, which they have set up to keep you afraid. You've got to be willing to endure it. You've got to be willing to even take it up. You know, it's like, don't even threaten me with that. I've already got it. I've got it on my back. I'm carrying the cross already. Now what are you going to threaten me with? I'm carrying your worst and I'm not worried about it. Jesus says you've got to be willing to accept the consequences that the, the system in power has put up to keep you afraid. And then you need to deny yourself, which means make sure you're not doing this for your own glory. Make sure it's not about you. This is not... For your self-interest, it's not to get you further along, it's not to make you stronger or to make you better. You're setting your own interests aside and you're thinking about God's interests, God's values. And if God's values are calling you forward, then you need to be willing to accept the consequences and to step forward against them and to speak out. Now, the times that we see this are when people are standing against empire, when they're standing against Oppression. We're thinking of people like Rosa Parks, right? Who's like, this is an unjust law. I don't care what you're going to do to try to make us afraid. I'm, I take that up. I accept it willingly, and I'm still going to do it because this is unjust. And it's not because Rosa Parks wants to be a great person. It's because God wants this to be changed, and I'm willing to be an agent of that change. She was willing to go forward, and she was willing to do it, and take all the things that the people Jesus is calling his crowds, to his, his disciples together and saying, this, this is what I need you to do. This is the, the upshot of living that kingdom is not letting the kingdoms of this world make you afraid. Stand up and be strong. Set your mind on divine things. Set aside your self-interest. And if God's calling you forward, then don't worry about what they've put up to keep you afraid. Follow me. And together, we're going to step forward it doesn't necessarily mean that um, everything has to be a battle. You know, for example, um, the closer we get to the kingdom of God, the fewer, hopefully, crosses we put up. So that in a book group, you can say those things, and it's okay, we'll talk it out. We're not going to push you out. In this church, you have a different opinion. We're not going to kick you out of this church. We're going to say, my goodness gracious, let's talk about this. What makes you think that? What makes us think this? Let's find a better way. That is the kingdom of, of God intersecting the kingdoms of the world. But prime, and and so, so it doesn't always have to be a battle. But today Jesus is calling us to courage. He's saying, be ready. All of us need to be ready. 
We need to be more ready to do what's right than to hold back because we're afraid of the consequences that have been built. Jesus wants disciples who are strong, who have courage, who have a, a, a willingness to risk. Because ultimately the goal is for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said, kingdom of Rome, empire of Rome, empire of Rome. He said, you should see my father's kingdom and just wait until my father's kingdom has come. Amen. Amen.